We, normal human being, have creative spirit. Composer, when you compose a sonata, satisfied. Poet, a poem. Painter, a painting. But for us, a well done experiment, outcome of a concept, is satisfaction of our creative urge, and that's what you live for. Those who are successful in science do share certain characteristics. Imagination, curiosity, uh, persistence, those are the important factors. Maurice Hilleman used a combination of intellectual brilliance, creativity, with this amazing ability to see the big picture and get things done. There is no equal accomplishment in the field of prevention of infectious diseases. Kids get vaccinated and they think that's been around for a hundred years. Of course it hasn't. It had to be invented someplace, it was invented at Merck by, by Mars. The way that you made vaccines in the 1940s and 50s and 60s was still, you know, just a lot of trial and error. This is a combination of the science and the art of vaccines. And there is no question, the guy mastered that. Of the 40-plus vaccines Hilleman developed in his lifetime, one would test his creative resolve more than any other. Hepatitis B is a very important infection worldwide, and there are some regions of the world where it is one of the major causes of morbidity and, and mortality. The one virus that was known to not only cause potentially chronic liver disease, but also liver cancer. And so that was a big deal. When Maurice worked on viruses like measles or mumps or German measles or chickenpox, those viruses were easily adapted to growth in cell culture. Not so hepatitis B. It wasn't really adapted to growth in cell culture at all. And so that made it very difficult to make vaccines the way Maurice was used to making them. One day, Blumberg, who is studying polymorphism of proteins, comes across an unusual antigen in the bloods of some people. And to make a long story short, it happens that this virus is kicking out surface antigen in little particles. That discovery is what turned Morris Hilleman on to the possibility that that basic information could be used to develop a vaccine. When I heard that, I said, my gosh, this is it. All you gotta have is an antigen and you're in the business if you're a vaccinologist. But how to generate a supply of the antigen? In a better world, the easy way to make the hepatitis B vaccine would be to take hepatitis B, grow it up in cell culture, and then just sort of strip away the protein and use that as the vaccine. Hepatitis B didn't grow in cell culture. What it grew well in was people. So if you want to have some of that virus to make a vaccine of it, you have to take it from the source which is available, which is the chronic carriers of that virus. So Dr. Hillman thought, okay, great, then I will use the blood of people who were infected with hepatitis B virus as my source of hepatitis B surface antigen. And the blood carried two things. It had the surface antigen, which was going to be used ultimately to make a vaccine, but also was loaded with, with live virus that causes liver cancer. Uh, that was not a project that a lot of people were gonna be willing to undertake. How are you gonna know that you've killed the virus if you don't have a, a, a cell culture test? What I did, I took a whole bunch of different viruses and we had a three-step process for purification and I showed that in each step of the way, this would kill all of the viruses we could put our hands on. In other words, basically, each of those steps was capable of killing all life forms. So if you use a thing and it's 
killed in one step and the next step it would be killed and killed. It should end up to be deader than deader than dead. So there are three potentially killing steps if there was anything surviving. And in spite of that, we ended up introducing the vaccine in, in 1981, just at the time that AIDS surfaced. The resolve to conquer this virus would be tested as never before. We had the development of hepatitis vaccine, and then all of a sudden we wind up with a new disease. So we just, you know, we're, we're ready to suppress one disease and all of a sudden another one comes up. The cause of AIDS wasn't known at the time, but the fear was that perhaps uh, there might be contamination of the vaccine with whatever caused AIDS. The preparation of the hepatitis B particle vaccine that Maurice made was absolutely free of HIV. But uh, just the, the cast was set at that time. You cannot really push this vaccine in the marketplace under these circumstances. The science wasn't there. We didn't understand the cause of AIDS. And therefore, we couldn't demonstrate that the cause was absent in the, in the product. And that, uh, there's no way around that. So, uh, what uh, did Merck and, and, and Maurice Hellman do? to go for the most courageous, most, in, in many ways, it was the most risky step that Maurice Hellman took in his total life to make a new vaccine. A new source of antigen would be needed. Maurice Hellman had used human blood as his source of hepatitis B surface antigen, which is just a protein. It's just one protein. So the question is, isn't there some way we could manufacture that protein? I was thinking, well, my God, if you want a source of making proteins, that's really what you're doing, making the components of a virus or whatever, what is better than a cancer cell which will grow in a submerged culture? Unlimited propagability how can you make a cancer cell acceptable? There was a, a cell line that was actually derived from a uh, soldier who was infected with hepatitis B, uh, the so-called Alexander cells. That was a cell that, that itself produced hepatitis B surface antigen, but it was essentially a transformed or cancerous cell. And so in that way, it wasn't terribly attractive. If you're worried about what might be the components of a cancer cell that would be carried forward into your vaccine, what would it be? What would you have to worry about? Obviously, the thing that propagates itself and that must be the basis for cancer has to be deranged nucleic acid. So now, how can you get rid of the nucleic acids? This is the dragon. So um, basically then, it's a matter of getting rid of the RNA and DNA. And you can do that with enzymes, RNAs and DNAs. And with this, we would slay the dragon. I had gone back and made hepatitis B vaccine using cancer cells. And I followed this new dogma that I had created Wonderful vaccine, good vaccine. We could have made it in those cancer cells. But at the same time, we had the recombinant business coming along, and that then would even remove the cancer problem. Technology changes and allows you to do things that you couldn't do when you started. So while Morris and the group were isolating the surface antigen, we had a visit from Bill Rutter, from the University of California in San Francisco, who had developed the, the discipline of uh, recombinant technology. Recombinant DNA technology was just coming. So the most courageous step which was taken at Merck at that time, and there is no question that Roy Vagelis was part of, uh, of that decision making, uh, they went after cloning uh, the uh, piece of the genome the piece of the genetic material of the virus that is responsible for those particles. 
You take a gene that codes for that protein. You then clone it into a plasmid, which is just a circular piece of, of DNA. You then take that plasmid and put it into a bacterial cell, or you put it into a yeast cell. And as that bacteria or yeast reproduces itself, it also makes this protein. So the bacteria itself becomes a protein-generating machine. And that was the answer. And here again, Morris, of course, could oversee these studies. Once we had that antigen, we put it over here in the vaccine, which took, what, two minutes <laughs> to substitute one for the other. And we got as good results with the yeast recombinant as we did with the plasma. That was the birth of the first recombinant vaccine in the world and the first vaccine for humans that could protect against cancer. The most important aspect of that story is the ability of Maurice to see that there is a, a next step he can take. And the next step was an order of magnitude higher science. The classic ways of developing vaccines are still uh, very fruitful, but it is going to be possible to develop uh, vaccines in, in ways that were um, only only dreams before. The accelerated timeline is really due doesn't to... doesn't use the virus to live through a patch of small needs. And came up with a prototype vaccine. messenger RNA. Together, the technology they found used to develop these vaccines was approved by the FDA for... What the future vaccine. needs is to develop a new immunology. To improve our knowledge of the pathogenesis of disease. What causes a disease and how can you counter that? So that literally I think one can produce in the laboratory virtually any antigen that you want, any substance that uh, might be of use uh, for uh, vaccination. Maybe there are even new methods for whereby the immune system functions that we aren't aware of. It's going to take a new generation of people to create that. People who are able to think differently. <laughs>